Welcome to Millennium Bible Institute's Introduction to the Mystery. This will give you an idea of some of the things that we have here at the Institute and some of the things that you'll find on the website. And because we have a lot of things to cover, let's get right to it and introduce you to God's mystery program with the church, the body of Christ. We are living in a period of time right now that the Bible calls the dispensation of Gentile grace. Uh, that period of time, and if you'll look here on the timeline with me, runs from the conversion of the Apostle Paul, listed over in the book of Acts, and runs all the way through to an event the Bible labels the Blessed Hope. We often refer to it as the rapture of the church, where the Lord descends from heaven, uh, the dead in Christ rise first, we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that is that dispensation of Gentile grace as outlined in your Bible. Now, the reason that's important is because that is the program of the mystery. What I need to do, though, is I need to kind of set the stage for this so that you'll understand that statement a little better. First of all, there are two great programs that are outlined in the Bible. If you look up at the timeline here, starting with the call of Abram, you have God's program with Israel because it is Abraham that God makes a covenant with, promises to make of him a great nation, multiply his seed as the sand of the seashore, and the nation of Israel is going to literally spring, of course, from Jacob, who is the father of the twelve tribes, but then back to Isaac, and then back to Abram, who uh, is the father of Isaac in a miraculous sense. Now, there's much to talk about that, but not in this program. This Israel program is going to continue along all the way through to the crucifixion of Jesus, which happens at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're familiar with that in your Gospels. Following that, in the book of Acts, that account takes up before the ascension of Jesus, during the 40 days in which Jesus is instructing His apostles to operate in His absence. All of this, all of this is the subject of Old Testament prophecy. When Jesus was here, His crucifixion, and then that message of the kingdom that's overseen by the Holy Spirit in the year following the crucifixion is all the subject of prophecy. That makes it part of the Israel program or part of the prophetic program. But at the end of that period of time, when the nation at large, and especially the religious leaders, have said no to the genuine offer of the kingdom to Israel, God interrupts that program with Israel and puts it on hold, so to speak. He then brings in the program of the mystery, and that is with the church, the body of Christ. Now, the reason I want to say that whole term is because Israel is called a church in the Scripture. And so I understand there will be some that will take issue if I just say it's the church or the church age. Yes, I understand that a church is a called out assembly. And Israel was a called out assembly. And that's true. And in that sense, they are a church. And so rightly, they are called a church. But there is the church, the body of Christ. That is something different from the church which was Israel. They constitute part of the mystery program when the Israel program has been put on hold. Now, to illustrate this for you, I want to show you where we Gentiles were uh, before God interrupted that program of Israel and brought, in to, brought into being a whole new program with a whole new people superintended by a whole new apostle who carried a whole new message. Now, there's a lot to that, and I hope to kind of break that down for you a little bit. But I want you to know that as Gentiles back here, and let me put this in, this is what the Apostle Paul calls time past. Now, this runs all the way up, like I said, to this, the start of this dispensation of Gentile grace. When Paul talks about the things that are happening in time past, he says that Gentiles, because remember, that's God's program with Israel, he says that Gentiles are twice dead. That means they are dead in two particular ways. They are dead because they're Gentiles, and God is not working with Gentiles here. He's working with Israel. And they are also dead because they're dead in trespasses and sins. Now, was Israel, when a guy was born in the nation of Israel, was he dead in trespasses and sin? Yes, he was. 
But because he was part of the favored nation, God's chosen people, he had a nearness to God through his Jewish heritage. Gentiles were on the outside. Now, there's a reason for that. It goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel that we don't have time to discuss here. But let me show you what the Apostle Paul writes about this in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says this, And you, being dead in your sins, there's the first death, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, there's the second one, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When Paul writes over here to the church, the body of Christ, in the book of Colossians, he says, you, before you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. That was the way that Gentiles were distinguished from the circumcision, which is the Jewish people. So we had two strikes against us. We were Gentiles when God was working with Israel, and that means we were on the outside looking in. And then in addition to that, we're dead in trespasses and sins, which means now we're totally on the outside. Now, what kind of position did that put us in? I want you to see this verse in Ephesians 2, where Paul is talking to Gentiles, and he says, back here in this time past, this is your condition. I want you to read this carefully. Here we go, Ephesians 2.11. Wherefore, remember that ye being... In time past, now there's that reference Paul made. In time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Let's pause there just for a moment. Let me just say that circumcision in the flesh made by hands was the Jewish nation. They practiced the circumcision. Gentiles were the uncircumcision. That's the title that they give us. Now let's go back and look at the PowerPoint. Verse 12, that at that time, that time passed, that at that time ye were, and here's the list, ye were without Christ. That's right, because Christ, when he was revealed in those gospels, came to the Jewish nation. Being Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and indeed we were outside the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise. That's right, because all the promises were to the Hebrew people, having no hope and without God in the world. Now that is a pretty desperate situation. If you look through that verse, and I encourage you to look it up on your own when you have time to look at that, Paul says that back here in time past, he says, you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. He says that you were uh, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, that's a hopeless situation. That's where we Gentiles were when God's program with Israel was going on. Now, look, I know probably... You've been raised up in church just like I have, and you're probably taught that God just worked with everybody all along. That verse says God wasn't working with everybody all along. He was working with the Hebrew nation, and we Gentiles were on the outside, and we were without hope and without God. But when God interrupted that program with Israel and brought about this new program of the mystery, and I'm using that word because the Bible uses that word, when he introduces this program, all of a sudden, we Gentiles who used to be on the outside now have a chance to be inside because God is working in this new dispensation, not with just the nation of Israel, but with Jew and Gentile alike, making up of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, or the church, the body of Christ. So let's take a look back in Ephesians the same book we were looking in just now, same chapter, just verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So let's put this in. O over here, we were time past. Here, but now. That's the dispensation of grace, the but now period. This time when... God has interrupted that program with Israel and has begun to work now calling out the body of Christ. That's the but now period. And we are not on the outside looking in. Now your sins can be forgiven 
You can become part of the body of Christ, and as such, you are made nigh or close to God by the blood of Christ. Whereas before, we were without hope and without God. Now we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. But there's something that's going to happen after that. There is another period over here, and we'll call this the ages to come. Because God, when He is finished with this program of the mystery, is going to restart the Israel program and finish it off, bringing into the kingdom, which is His intention from the very beginning. And that, Paul calls in this same chapter in Ephesians, the ages to come. Take a look with me here, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now there's really a whole lot more in those two verses than what I'm talking about here. The fact of the matter is we are going to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places in the ages to come. For Israel, that program on the earth is going to be completed. Remember, we get raptured out at the end of our program. God restarts that program with Israel. Uh, It goes through that tribulation, that seven-year period. Most of you are probably familiar with. Then the Lord returns at the second advent and fights that Armageddon campaign, sets up His kingdom. The Lord Jesus sits down on the throne of David, and He will go into that millennial kingdom until all enemies are put under his feet. And that's the whole purpose of the millennium and the last great battle there at the end. And then we go out into the eternal kingdom. Well, in those ages to come, God has a special thing planned for every member of the body of Christ. Something that is spectacular that we do not hear much about. We are not coming back to this earth to reign, but we are actually going to reign with the head of the body, Jesus Christ, in the heavenly places in the eternal kingdom. And that's a pretty exciting thing. Well, as we talk about this mystery program, let me talk about some false assumptions. One of those I just mentioned to you, and that is when the Lord comes back and and, and begins to wrap all this up, we are not coming back to the earth to reign. Now, I used to teach that, and I was taught that and mentored that, but that's actually not what the Bible says. The Bible's pretty clear about it, that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. There is something that is going to happen up in the heavenly places that is necessary that God has particularly made the body of Christ to perform. He will use Israel to repossess the earth and to himself, and he will use the church, the body of Christ, to reconcile the heavenly places back to himself. Now, in order to understand what all that is about, you'll have to know something about the great conflict between Satan and God and who is going to have possession of heaven and earth. And that's what this whole thing is about. So that you don't reign on earth, but we will reign in the heavenlies and be part of that program to reconcile the heavenlies back to God. The second misconception is that people think, well, to be saved in this age, then you are saved by works. But I want to show you something out of the Scripture that, sh- that, that is something very different. You see, Israel had a standing before God that was based on their obedience to the law. If they obeyed that law, they got certain blessings. And if they violated that law, they got certain curses put upon them. And the Bible tells you exactly what those are. And I'm talking about... Um, Oh, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 38. And there's several other places that actually tell you what those are. But people get the idea because they go back and they read those passages to the Israel program and they put that into the dispensation of grace and they say, okay, well, you know what? When you get it saved in this day, you're going to trust in Jesus, but you have to do something about that. Well, Paul addresses that false idea and I want to show it to you because it is something particular to the time in which we're living. He goes to great trouble to tell us that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. Look with me here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
And then in the next verse, 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now, there's a couple of things at work here. First of all, people get to thinking, if you tell people they're not under the law and they're under grace, it just gives them a license to sin. And Paul anticipates that argument when he says, what then? Uh, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. He says, that's not the issue at all. The second thing is, you can't be free, that first verse that talked about uh, we're not, uh, it said, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law but under grace. Sin doesn't have dominion over us because we are not under the law. We are not under a performance contract. If we were under the law, sin would still have dominion over you and you would never be able to accomplish that which God has called us to accomplish in this dispensation. Make no mistake. What we have been called to do as saints in the dispensation of grace, Israel will never be able to accomplish until the day of atonement before the kingdom when they are recipients of the new covenant and God writes His law in their hearts and puts a new heart within them and puts His Spirit in them and forgives their sins and iniquities and remembers them, remembers them against them no more and they become sons of God in the kingdom, until that happens, they will never be able to produce what we have been called to produce right here and now. One of the great differences in the mystery program and in the Israel program. They're waiting for those things to happen to them, and God has made a more excellent way for the church, the body of Christ. That's an important thing to understand. Now, the next fallacy is that, okay, you may be saved by grace, but if you're going to stay saved, you're going to have to keep yourself by works. Now, that's a little clever twist on that, but I want to show you Paul's response to that, because in this age, Paul is showing us that once we're saved, we are not kept by our works either. We're not saved by our works, and we're not kept by our works. So let's take a look at it here in uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. He says this, O foolish Galatians! Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You see, they had the idea, someone had come along to the Galatians, and deceive them about how all this was really working. And they thought, okay, we, we started out by faith, by believing in what Christ had already done for us, but we're going to be made perfect by the flesh. Paul says, do you understand how foolish that is? That you think somehow you're going you're to improve and build upon what Jesus did for you by your works. That's never going to happen. Now, our standing before God, therefore, is not of works. Now, I, I want to nail this home for you. So here it is in Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. Paul says in addressing this issue, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see, when someone says, I'm going to be saved by works, or I'm saved by grace, but I'm kept by works, or I'm saved by grace and kept by grace, but my standing before God every day is by works. Paul says, look, if it's by works, it's no longer grace. And that's why he told you, you're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. Grace is a free gift. It's just given to you. It's not that which you earn. It's not that which you deserve. It's just given to you as a gift. Paul says, if it's grace, then it's no longer about works. It's not about works in your salvation. It's not about works in your security. And it's not about works in your standing. And he says, and if it is works, then it's not grace any longer. So you have to take your pick. It's either going to be by works or it's going to be by grace. Now, Paul says, we're not under the law we're under grace. And because he's our apostle, then he's the one that we go with with that. The next thing to know about the mystery program and the Israel program is that there are vast differences between these two programs. I want to show you that 
course, the Israel program, that thing was predicted. God told Abraham that he would make of him a great nation, multiply his seed. He talked about a, a specific piece of real estate over there, the land of Canaan, that he would give to him and, and to his seed after him forever. He talked about even uh, uh, about a, a kingdom that was going to be established as he went through the covenants with Israel, uh, the Davidic covenant. Talked about a throne that would be set up, and it talked about uh, an, an eternal kingdom that would be set up, and of that kingdom there would be no end, and all the things that apply to the Israel program were prophesied known about and expected but when it comes to this mystery program of which we are a part God kept that a secret from everyone from the foundation of the world not one single angel knew about the mystery program not one single person ever prophesied about the church the body of Christ God said that whole thing was a mystery. It was a secret. It was hidden. And I'm going to show you these verses because I want you to see them. We don't hear about them much in church anymore. But that's, the, that's one of the main distinctions between our program and the Israel program is that God kept this thing a secret. And now that it's been revealed to the Apostle Paul, he's the one that's going to show us how this program is going to run. That's where we get our marching orders. And the reason that's important to know is because if we don't understand the distinctiveness and the uniqueness of our program, we'll be tempted to go back and pull elements of the Israel program out and import it into the dispensation of grace, and we'll take a dispensation of the law and now put it to work under grace without ever realizing Paul said you can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. It's grace or it's works. It's either a dispensation of the law or it's a dispensation of grace. It's a real violation of the Scripture to do that. So let me show you a verse here. Romans 16, 25. This verse pretty much wraps the whole thing into a nutshell as far as the mystery program. Now to him that has the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. The revelation of the mystery God revealing the mystery was something Paul said was kept secret until it was revealed to him. Let me show you what he writes to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. So Paul says, hey, now this thing is being revealed. It was a secret from the foundation of the world. This was not made known in ages past. I've only shown you two verses. There's a number of verses here where Paul talks about the things that he is writing and the doctrine that he is presenting and the way you're supposed to live your Christian life is not found in the Old Testament prophets under the Israel program. It is found in the mystery program that is specifically to and about the church, the body of Christ. That's the people that Paul is writing to, and, the, and he's the apostle we need to be paying attention to. So let me talk about some differences. Because you say, does it really make any difference? I mean, if you've got an Israel program and a mystery program and God does them both, does it really make any difference? Well, first of all, let me tell you that our conduct is very different. How is it different? Let me just give you one way for the sake of time here. And that is, we do not practice a religion. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is only one religion that God ever instituted in the history of the world, and it was the religion of Judaism, and He gave it to Israel. You understand what a religion is. It has ordinances and practices and things that you do. Did Israel have a religion? Well, let me ask you, were they supposed to bring an unblemished lamb that was a male of the first year on a specific day of the year and make a sacrifice? Well, you know that's the Day of Atonement, and you, and you would say yes, and, and God forgave their sins for a year. Was there ever a Passover observance that they were supposed to go through the motions of and rehearse and remember and, and pass down to generations? Yes, that was part of their religion. Was there a high priest who had a specific garment on and they would come and there were, there were areas in which he ministered and others could, and everybody, did everybody just walk into the Holy of Holies? Well, of course not. Do you know why? This was a religion. 
This thing had observances. This thing had ceremonies. This things that people had to do. That was what made it a religion. That's the only religion God ever put into the world. But when he interrupted that program with Israel, and he says, in the body of Christ, there is no more Jew or Gentile, no more male or female, no more bond or free, but you're all part of the body. All of that religion was put on hold right along with the program for which it was created. And now God brings about this dispensation that he kept hidden from the foundation of the world. And he says, and there's no practices for you because yours is not a religion waiting on something spiritual out in the future. I'm actually going to make a spiritual change in you right here and now, and you're going to have a relationship with me, and you're going to be sons of God now. It's that relationship. That's why you can come into my home and you can take away every book and every item. You can clear it out and you didn't take away my religion because I don't have one. What I have is in here. It's a relationship that I serve as a son to my father. Now, I know that we get used to that terminology, but there's way more in that phrase than meets the eye. Now, let me just tell you that it's not about the practice of ceremonies and the going through of motions and observing of Sabbaths and, and, and doing feast days. That's not for you. As a matter of fact, we don't have time to talk about it here, but Paul even talks about you're not involved in that. That's not what your program is about. That's, that's part of Satan's policy of evil is to pull believers in this dispensation back into the dispensation of the law and make them do the observances and the ceremonies and the Sabbaths and the feast days and new moons and all that kind of business. You know why? Because that is exactly the opposite of what you're supposed to be putting forth in this day. But we hear little about that, which is why... At the Institute, we want to promote the mystery because that's the age you're living in. Hey, if we were living under the Israel program, I'd be talking to you about observing the Sabbath and keeping the feast days, and obeying the law, walking in the right way, and studying the Old Testament prophets to, to know what we're supposed to do. Now, we'll be honest, we are supposed to study the Old Testament prophets, but not to practice the Israel program, but to have the knowledge so that we understand better the things that are happening here in the mystery program. Here's another difference between those two programs. Not only is our conduct supposed to be different, but our promises are different. Israel had specific promises. We have specific promises. You know, people... Mm, boy, there's a lot of things to say about this, so I need to just sum this up in a word, and that is to say this. Our promises are in accordance with our adoption. Now, you think about that. And if you have any kind of groundwork in the Bible at all, I know you'll be able to understand some things about that. Our promises are in accordance with our adoption because we have been called unto something that we can actually perform here and now, and those promises are in accordance with that. We're not waiting for it out there. Are there things we are waiting for? Yeah, we are waiting for the redemption of our body at the rapture. We are waiting for that. We are waiting to get into those heavenly places. But that, that, the, the promises that are given to us to, to live in and out of every day of our life are readily available to us, and they're different from Israel's. The next thing is our future is different. I mentioned earlier, we're going to be up in the heavenly places occupying positions of authority there with Jesus Christ while Israel has always been promised to be the head of all nations on this earth. The 12 apostles, Jesus said, would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel would minister to the Gentile nations and those Gentile nations would submit themselves to Israel as the head of all nations. That's going to happen on the earth. Our program is going to be carried out in the heavenly places. The next thing is our equipping is different. When God was doing things with Israel, it was always outwardly. Did you ever notice that? It was 
you know, giving them victory over their enemies. It was giving them manna when there was no food. It was bringing water from the rock when there was nothing to drink. It was parting the Red Sea when the Egyptian army was behind them. It was making their crops produce and bumper loads. It, you know, all those kinds of things. It was not putting any of the diseases of the nations around them on them. It was that their children would be healthy. Their livestock would be plenteous. They would lend and not borrow. All of those things are there in the Israel program, and those things are all very physical in nature. But when you get into the dispensation of grace, God is doing something with you that He could not do with Israel because Israel entered into a covenant with God whereby they would establish their own righteousness. You cannot labor with God until you have a... Uh, this is off the point. I start it, so I'll just say it. You cannot labor with God until you have a perfect justification and sanctification. When you talk about the three elements of godliness, thinking like God thinks, acting like God acts, and laboring with God in what He is doing, and that's a sonship issue, the son laboring in, with the Father in what the Father is doing, when you get ready to do that, you cannot labor with God in anything until you have a perfect justification and a perfect sanctification. And what Israel did when they entered into that law contract is they contracted to, us, to establish their own justification and sanctification through their own righteousness. And God knew they could never do it. And that's why all of those promises that will one day be theirs out of the kingdom when the new covenant is put upon them, they will never achieve on their own. They never achieved it before. They crucified their Messiah. They will not achieve it in the future until God Himself, by His Jehovahness and grace, gives it to them as a gift because they'll never earn it. Now, what just strikes me as funny is we've got a bunch of folks around this dispensation seeing that the fact that Israel never could do it as God's chosen people, and somehow they think they can. Well, that's an enigma to me. But, but, but our equipping is different because what you're being equipped to do is something in your inner man that Israel cannot do until they get the new covenant. Our standing is different. Our standing is by grace. Their standing is by performance, as I told you before. Go to Leviticus 26 and just read the chapter. Instead of saying, you know what, this is really strange. I don't remember ever hearing any of this. This sounds pretty crummy to me. Why don't you read the Bible and then make a decision? That's all I'm really asking. Go to Leviticus 26 and see if God says, and if you obey my commandments and walk in my ways and observe my statutes to do them, then I will cause the rain to come upon your crops and I'll make sure none of the diseases come upon you and I'll give you victory over your enemies and I'll give you storehouses with plenty and I'll make you to be at peace with your... He does all of this thing and he said, but, he said, but if you walk contrary unto me and you break my laws... He says, I will walk contrary unto you, and I will, and then he tells them what he'll do. The whole history of Israel has been that God used this nation to punish them because they were rebellious. God punished them. So what does he do? He uses Elijah to close the heavens for three and a half years, no rain. What happened all through the ministry of Elijah and Elisha, through the time of the, the 450 years of the judges, the divided kingdom itself was one of those curses that God said He would bring upon them. And then sure enough, following Solomon, the kingdom is divided, a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and then those both wind up going away into captivity. Why? Because they served God? No, because they broke His law and they were in a performance contract. But the difference is you and I are not under a performance contract. We have a different standing. Now, people want to take what they understand about the Israel program and bring it into this program. Well, I had a flat tire, and I know God's punishing me because I lost my temper the other day. Or, well, my investment didn't pan out, and I know God's punishing me because... Oh, here's one on a national deal. I, you know what? I'll tell you why they had that, uh, that hurricane down there in New Orleans, because God was punishing America because America's practicing abortion. Or, 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 or this, this flood happened over in the Midwest because uh, uh, we encouraged Israel to give away land. Or we, and they got all that kind of stuff. You really think that we're living under a performance contract? Really? Really? 
You really think we're under a performance contract when a guy that loves God and loves the Word and is in the Word and is faithful and testifies to the grace of God can hardly pay his bills and, and, and has all kinds of trauma, but there's a drug dealer or, a, or, or, or a, 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 a guy that runs a prostitution ring, a pimp, that makes more money than that guy will ever make, that drives a nicer car, that lives in a bigger house, that has more clothes, and you think God is imputing men's sins unto them? Well, you haven't been paying attention, have you? You're telling me then that the guy with the most money with the easiest life is the godliest man. Because if you're living under a performance contract, that's exactly what you're signing up for. But the Bible says, I should have put this on the PowerPoint, but I knew I'd run out of time, and our time is running out. But the Bible says that in this age, God is not imputing men's sins unto them. That's why the dope dealer will make way more money than I will teaching the Bible. Not because God favors him more, but because God is not in grace. Listen, under the law, it wouldn't be that way. But under grace, God is not imputing men's sins unto them. Yet, Can I jump ahead to the future here and tell you something about that? When you get all the way over, and I didn't put it up here, but right over here is a little thing called the great white throne judgment. All the dead are going to stand before him. All those people that rejected Jesus Christ and God did not impute their sins unto them and they lived sins of abomination and debauchery and evil and everything imaginable, that wicked that you can think of and God did not impute their sins unto them. Let me tell you, when the day comes that they're called up out of hell to stand before God, here's what happens at the great white throne. God takes all of those sins and imputes them back on them at the great white throne judgment. During this age, God is not imputing their sins unto them. But once they die, or the age is over, when they stand before God at the great white throne, every one of those sins are going to be imputed back onto them, and that will determine their affliction in the lake of fire forever. Now, God in His graciousness in this age is not imputing men's sins unto them. So our standing is different. Our prayer life is different. We really don't have time to talk about that, but let me tell you what God expects. He expects us to pray like a grace age saint, not like a Jew under the law. And we have to understand what that is about. There's another difference, and that is our posture in this world is different. Here's what God called Israel to do. Come out and be separate. Don't, you know what? Don't be like these nations. You, you, you put yourself over here, seclude yourself off, Push them out from you. Here's what he says to the church, the body of Christ. You're not of the world, but you're in the world because you're supposed to be having an effect on the world. The only thing that we withdraw ourselves from is a brother who walks disorderly. And that's for the purpose of bringing him back. It's for the purpose of restitution, not just punishing him, for the purpose of bringing him back. But as far as the world, it, it, someone says, well, I can't, Someone says, I can't go in that restaurant. There's, you know, the people that, there are people going in that restaurant. They're just the scum of the earth. I can't go in there. I'm supposed to be separate. See, we, we got that idea from the Israel program. But when you cut this program, you know what? You, you, they're, you're the only light they're going to see. So God has a different program for you. A whole lot more to talk about about that. But our posture in the world is different. Our blessings are different than those in the Israel program. All those blessings over here to Israel, read through those blessings in the Old Testament. Read through every one of them. Read through every single one of them. Guess what they all have in common? They're physical in nature. Rain on the crops, health to the kids, multiplying the livestock, peace with your enemies, overcoming them in war, wealth, prosperity, all those kinds of things. They're all physical. 100% of the blessings to Israel that they received back here are all physical in nature. You know why? Because they're not in a position to receive a single spiritual blessing. And they won't be until they get the new covenant, until they finally figure out we can't establish our own righteousness. It has to be done through our Messiah, Jesus Christ. But you, on the other hand, you, on the other hand, have been prepared to receive those spiritual blessings. So our blessings are distinct and different from those of the Israel program. Here's the next one. Our chastisement is different. 
God used the circumstances of life to chasten Israel. He brought their enemies against them. He dried up the heavens. There was no rain. All kinds of things like that. To, but that's not how he chastens us. There are three ways that the Bible says, Paul's epistles tell us that we are chastened of the Lord and none of it is through the circumstances of life. But we don't look at that. All we do is run back to the Old Testament, get a bunch of verses and pipe them into the dispensation of grace. And what I'm trying to get you to do is understand that there's a big difference there because every day that Satan can continue to get you to live like you're in a dispensation of the law in the Israel program is a day he laughs at the face of God that God's own new creation indwelled by his spirit doesn't have enough spiritual perception to understand the age in which they're living even though it's written in sixth grade English in a book they all possess. So, I know I'm getting a little carried away on the thing, but the thing about it is we have to wake up to that. The plan of evil against us is different. The thing against Israel was a defiling, corrupting plan to keep them from becoming that great nation. The plan for us is to make sure we don't understand about the mystery. If we do understand it, we reject it as untrue because it slaughters too many of our sacred cows. And if we do believe it and we do adhere to it, now the plan is whatever it takes to remove us back to what we used to believe. That is the plan of evil in this day. That's not what was going on with Israel. That was a different thing altogether. Well, in the last couple of minutes here, let me just tell you that um, when we understand the mystery, and by the way, that plan against us has been pretty successful. Most people don't. They go to church every day, every week, and they go to church and they never hear a single sermon about the mystery program for the church, the body of Christ. They couldn't define the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery if their life depended on it because their preacher has never said a word about it. We never got grounded in the basic doctrines that comprise this dispensation, that they actually work through this dispensation. We don't even know them. And the, and the sad fact about that is, I'm just trying to beat up on preachers, but the sad fact, because I was one of those preachers for a long time, but I will tell you the sad thing about that is, is because the preachers don't know. Because our schools don't turn that out anymore. Satan has successfully maneuvered it so that now we don't even see the Bible for the thing that it is supposed to be. So let me finish up by just saying, when you understand, let me just give you a list of things you'll understand when you understand the mystery. When you understand the mystery, you will understand why bad things happen to good people and why... Good things happen to bad people. You will finally understand that you won't go anymore. I would just, I can't for the life of me figure it out. That person was so good. I just, you know what? I'd never known anybody like that. And for this to happen to them, I just don't understand it. When you understand the mystery, you'll never ask that question again. When you understand the mystery, you will understand exactly what to expect from God in prayer and know that you will get that answer every single time without exception. When you understand the mystery, you will understand who you have been made to be in Christ, and more importantly, why He has made you that. When you understand the mystery, you will understand that suffering comes in one of three categories. Paul outlines them all in his epistles and tells you exactly what to do depending on what kind of suffering you are undergoing. When you understand the mystery, you'll understand about your adoption, and why it is probably the most crucial element to your spiritual life. When you understand the mystery, you'll understand why we are promised a glorified body and no one else. When you understand the mystery, it's a broad spectrum, so here it goes. When you understand the mystery, you'll understand how angels think and why they think that way. And that was a great revelation. When you understand the mystery, you'll understand why this, that God kept this age a secret from the foundation of the world, and then revealed it by the Apostle Paul, who winds up writing 13 of the 27 books that are commonly called the New Testament in your Bible. When you understand the mystery, you will understand why Jesus, in his earthly ministry, never mentioned this age one time. When you understand the mystery, you will understand why Satan hates the saved members of the body of Christ in this age so much, and why he has declared war on them. When you understand the mystery, you will know how to handle the scriptures that seem to contradict themselves. And I would have given you a couple, but I knew we'd be out of time, which we have about a minute, and that's it. When you understand the mystery, you will understand why people prior to this age did not get saved believing the same gospel by which you got saved. And I know that, that, that sounds crazy, but you have to ask yourself, 
If those guys walked around with Jesus for three and a half years preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and you think the gospel of the kingdom is the same as the gospel of the grace of God, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, how come none of them understood the resurrection or expected him to rise from the dead? When the women came back from the tomb and said they'd seen an angel that testified of the resurrection of the Lord, it said, and, the, and it seemed to them as fables, and they believed them not. Why would Thomas, who walked with Jesus for three and a half years, say, you think you saw the risen Lord? I won't believe it till I put my hands in the nail prints and in his side. Because the gospel they were preaching was not the gospel of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It was the gospel of the kingdom, which has nothing to do with that. That's the difference between an Israel program and a mystery program. And there's a thousand other things we could talk about as the difference, but in eight seconds, I can't do it. So here's what I encourage you to do. Get on our website, figure out what it is that's on there that you need, and get busy learning because there's a bunch of Bible to know, and it affects the way you live your life in this age, either manipulated by the satanic plan of evil to deceive you about what really is going on, or you will believe what you find in that book we call the Word of God and live your life accordingly. God bless you, and I hope you'll study the Bible.